Hello and welcome to our conference session entitled Being the Change That Others Don't Want, Asserting and Resisting Racial Hierarchies in Mid-Century North America. My name is Johannes Breit, but I'm also known as Kami Space Invader on the subreddit, and I will be chairing the session tests in the United States and Canada centered on the subjects of fascism and race. The panel focuses on a variety of actors engaging in protests and counter-protests, on questions of framing and reframing protests and agendas, as well as on reaction and reflection of social upheaval, all centered around the topics of race and fascism. By asking questions about language, effectiveness of protests, and the role of so-called moderates, this panel presents a historical perspective on subjects that are ever more present and urgent in this very age. With that all said, it is my great pleasure to introduce the first of our three speakers today. Tyler Wenzel is a Canadian historian, lawyer, and military officer, and is presently military faculty at the Canadian Forces College in Toronto, Canada. He will be presenting his paper, Fascists in Hawktown, Toronto's Reaction and Resistance to the National Unity Party during the summer of 1938. The National Unity Party was Canada's first national fascist party. It unified fringe groups from Nova Scotia to British Columbia with the purported goal of uniting all Canadians, French or English, Protestant or Catholic. However, their goal was, in their own words, unity of Canada for all Canadians, with some exceptions. The National Unity Party was flagrantly xenophobic and anti-Semitic, made regular use of Nazi salutes and symbols, and advocated for the halt to Jewish immigration and the deporting of Jews already in Canada to Madagascar or, with a Canadian twist, a new colony to be established in the Hudson's Bay. In early July 1938, the National Unity Party held its founding conference in Kingston, Ontario. The Kingston City Council had refused the group access to public buildings and had refused to grant them a permit for a public march. So the Kingston Conference was held in secret in somebody's home. The same was somewhat true in Toronto, or Hogtown as it was often called. Toronto City Council refused the group access to public venues, but it would not interfere in the rental of a private venue. So the National Unity Party planned its first rally in Toronto on July 4th at Massey Hall, one of the largest venues in the city. I won't attempt to cover how every group erected to the, quote, arrival of the National Unity Party in Toronto. Instead, I will focus on the three organizations that organized counter-protest events on the very same night as the National Unity Party rally. The first group was the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. This was the principal social democratic party in Canada at the time. For Canadians, this was the original New Democratic Party. At the time, it was roughly analogous to the Socialist Party of America or the Independent Labour Party or the left wing of the Labour Party in the UK. It was a new party with a reasonable following. 1935 was its first federal election where they won seven of 245 seats, which is to say that it had a voice, but it was a long way from forming a government. The second group was the League for Peace and Democracy. The organization was principally run by the Communist Party of Canada, which was the Canadian section of the Communist International. At the time, they were employing the Popular Front strategy of publicly forsaking revolution and instead courting popularity with liberals and social democrats. The League for Peace and Democracy was an important forum in which this sort of collaboration took place. The third and final group was the League for a Revolutionary Workers' Party. This was the most militant left-wing group in Toronto at the time. It had split from the left opposition, i.e. the Trotskyists in 1934, and in response to the growth of fascism in Toronto, they had unified with the Workmen's Circle, a Jewish working class organization, and the Toronto Libertarian Group, the Anarchists, to establish the Provisional Anti-Fascist Committee. The National Unity Party rally was held on the 4th of July at Massey Hall, and it was attended between 1,500 and 2,500 people. It was a ticketed event and guarded by 85 blue-shirted stormtroopers. Police protection on foot and on horseback was provided outside the hall. Also of note, there were several members serving in the Canadian military at the time who attended the rally in uniform. The first protest against the National Unity Party rally was organized by the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. It was held at Queen's Park that night, the home of Ontario's provincial parliament. About 500 people attended. The rally was barely a news item, except that one of the speakers, who wore a mask to protect his identity, 
took to the podium to announce that he had worked with the National Unity Party and he had stolen documents that showed that they were in part funded by money from Germany, that they had smuggled revolvers across the American border at Niagara Falls, and that ex-German military officers were providing their young members training in military tactics. The largest counter rally that night was held at Maple Leaf Gardens, the largest venue in the city. 10,000 or so people attended the meeting under the auspices of the Canadian League for Peace and Democracy. Speakers included A.A. A. McLeod, a Communist Party of Canada leader and the National Director of the Canadian League for Peace and Democracy, R.L. Calder, a Montreal lawyer and the Vice Chairman of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Reverend Salem Bland, John W. Buckley of the Trades and Labour Council, and former American Ambassador to Germany, William Dodd. So this was a relatively broad group of people. At 10,000 people, this was a large gathering, certainly, but a crowd of a similar size regularly attended sporting events in the same numbers at the same venue. For instance, Maple Leaf Gardens the following week hosted a wrestling match between Vic Christie and The Masked Marvel. And in the days before television, a crowd of this size was, was fairly normal for a venue like this. The noisiest rally was held by the League for a Revolutionary Workers Party, a leading organization within the Provisional Anti-Fascist Committee. They assembled between 200 and 500 demonstrators and they started their activities less than a block away from Massey Hall, whereas the other rallies were several blocks away. This group held two rallies protesting smaller fascist meetings earlier in the summer, and both had been broken up by the police. Both groups, the League for Revolutionary Workers Party and the police, had learned from each encounter and adapted accordingly. At the first rally, an officer had been struck by a sign. So at the second rally, the police took away the LRWP signs. At this third rally, the League for a Revolutionary Workers' Party carried very few signs, and instead, the women of the group concealed sweaters that bore anti-fascist slogans, and they hid them under their coats, taking off the coats to reveal the slogans at the appointed time. And this time, unlike the first two rallies, the police did not wait for the crowd to become raucous or to begin their planned march. Instead, they cracked down as soon as William Crame, the leader of the group and subject of my next book, took to the soapbox to give his speech. As soon as he stepped up on the podium and started to speak, the police ordered him to stop. Cram ignored them. He continued to speak. He denounced the fascists and he denounced the police as tools of the fascists. Two members of the League for a Revolutionary Workers Party came to assist Cram, as well as a, from what I can tell, unaffiliated protester, and all four were arrested. Mounted units then moved in to disperse the crowd, and they continued to patrol while the National Unity Party rally continued, only disrupted by two women who apparently had snuck into the event and attempted to shout down the main speaker, Adrian Arcand, from the balcony. Blue shirted stormtroopers threw these two women out onto the street. So a few thoughts on these reactions. First, let's not lose sight of the fact that the number of anti-fascist rally goers that night outnumbered the fascists. Massey Hall played host to 1,500 to 2,500 people, either members or supporters of the National Unity Party. In contrast, 12,000 or so people went out to protest fascism that night. Second, participation in the protest events was in excess of the membership of the groups that organized them. The League for a Revolutionary Workers Party never had more than 100 members, but they were able to get 200 to 500 people out on the streets for a planned direct confrontation with the National Unity Party. The Communist Party of Canada likely numbered never more than 25,000 members nationally, but they were able to sell 11,000 tickets to fill Maple Leaf Gardens interest went well beyond their membership. Third, you will note that I have not mentioned any rallies organized by the Liberal Party, which formed both the provincial and federal governments at the time, the Conservative Party, major religious groups, or other large community groups. That's because there were none. The political mainstream was largely silent. The moderate groups, as groups, took no action, although many of their members certainly attended the aforementioned rallies, especially the League for Peace and Democracy rally. The center was fairly quiet, while the fringe was noisy. Fourth, even in the face of a subject that all three of these groups certainly agreed upon the cause of anti-fascism, they could not work together even on this important occasion. The League for Revolutionary Workers Party invited both the Communist Party of Canada and the Canadian League for Peace and Democracy, as well as the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation to be part of their anti-fascist committees. They declined. The Communist Party's League for Peace and Democracy tried to work with the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation and although these two groups had had some positive collaboration regarding the Spanish Civil War, 
the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation did not want to be associated with the communists, even on this, the occasion of this important event. These groups just simply could not work together. Now, certainly, protests and demonstrations are not the only way to express resistance to a fascist movement. But it is telling that there are only three very separate protests, and the expressions of solidarity amongst them were few. Why is this? Well, certainly some of it was by design. The League for Peace and Democracy, for instance, argued that confronting the fascists directly only gave them the attention that they needed to grow into a mass movement. Indeed, the Communist Party press, who always had harsh word for Trotskyists or near Trotskyists, said that the League for Revolutionary Workers Party was largely responsible for the growth of the fascist movement. But mostly, I think, the indifference was largely because the majority of Torontonians were indifferent to the dangers of Nazism. And many, even if they did not go so far as to don a blue shirt, were sympathetic to a form of fascism rooted in reinforcing their own sense of Britishness and Canadianness. And solidarity against the fascist movement did not grow in the wake of the summer of 1938. Instead, it was stymied by independent intervening events, that being German foreign policy. Over the summer, there were rumors of German spies attempting to enter Canada. Former Prime Minister R.B. Bennett announced the discovery of a German plan for, to seize Anticosti Island in the St. Lawrence. And the German annexation of Sudetenland two months later took away a great deal of the support that the National Unity Party at first seemed to enjoy. But it would be a mistake to view this as a widespread rejection of Nazism and anti-Semitism that the National Unity Party represented. The reaction that undid the National Unity Party was not a backlash against their racist ideas or of their political ideals, but rather it was a backlash against the relationship with the German state. In the summer of 1938, the National Unity Party was not defeated nor even meaningfully marginalized by any kind of anti-fascist solidarity in Toronto. This incident certainly provides lessons for uh, future resistors to fascist movements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Next in our panel, we'll hear from Ryan Abt. Ryan Abt is a PhD candidate in United States history, and he will be presenting his paper, Everyone I Don't Like is Hitler, The Appropriation of Anti-Nazi Axioms by American Fascists, 1944 to 1949. In late June of this year, Amidst the abundant protests against discrimination towards people of color, against police brutality, and against the maintenance of racist symbols, a U.S. county DA lawyer reposted a picture and caption on Facebook. The meme stated, wedding bands that were removed from Holocaust victims prior to being executed in 1945 and had an image of people holding rings from a box. The, the post said, each ring represents a destroyed family Never forget, Nazis tore down statues. Nazis banned free speech, blamed economic hardships on one group of people, instituted gun control. Sound familiar? One rightfully wonders, how did the Holocaust, representing the racially motivated and intentional murder of roughly six million Jews, become an analogy for opposing anti-discrimination protests? How did an event so clearly representing the dangers of discrimination and racial hatred come to not only represent the dangers of gun control based on an erroneous claim that the Nazis uh, banned all guns, but also become a central analogy in silencing claims of racial discrimination. The answer in part comes from the way that the society of the 1940s, represented by the educators I study, perceived of the origins, meaning, and lessons drawn from Nazi racial policies. They presented discrimination as a tool used by the Nazis to gain power domestically and to subvert enemies internationally. In both cases, they saw fomenting prejudice as a method used by the Nazis to divide and conquer their enemies. The educators responded by overlooking racial and religious differences in order to create performed unity. In the post-war period, however, conservative and far-right educators criticized domestic liberals, socialists, and communists when they challenged racism and discrimination in America. Importantly, they argued that the leftists were attempting to divide and conquer the country to prepare it for communist rule. In other words, they tied what had previously been seen as a Nazi method to all leftists through the category of totalitarianism. Thus, the coverage of the liberation of German concentration camps, which might have represented the dangers of the persecution of either racial or political enemies, instead served to solidify anti-totalitarian, primarily anti-communist, rhetoric as the Cold War developed. 
rhetoric that often silenced victims of racial, religious, and political discrimination. Much of the World War II era propaganda produced for or utilized by schools in the United States centered around the danger of Nazi tactics of subversion. American educators believed that Nazi persecution of the Jews and others resulted primarily from political calculations rather than ideological devotion. I'm going to focus on a particular film entitled Greater Victory as an example. It's produced by the National Coalition of Christians and Jews, and it signifies the impulses of a great number of the anti-discrimination materials produced for schools. According to this film and many educators, the subversive effects of Nazi racism threatened the United States. In Greater Victory, two escaped German soldiers seeking to accomplish some nefarious act of subversion explained to an American relative that the Nazis are not defeated in 1944, a soldier states that they've already prepared to overthrow the United States internally. The soldier said, it's so easy. First, we make them hate the Jews. Then we make them hate the Catholics. Then we make them hate the Protestants. And when they're all so busy fighting each other, we'll take over. It worked in Belgium, Austria, France, and it will work here. He further stated that we Germans have spent years planting our ideas here. Race hatred, religious antagonism, class hatred. The two soldiers clearly laid out for Americans the perceived strategy and danger of the Nazis. Racial conflict served as a political tool used by the Nazis to defeat foes, not as a strongly held component of their ideology. Together with numerous textbooks, intercultural education pamphlets, and other anti-discrimination films, a singular message about the dangers of Nazism came to the fore. Even if defeated militarily, Nazis and their domestic allies sought to divide and conquer America in order to defeat and control it. The solution also seemed clear. Americans needed unity. Importantly, these anti-Nazi texts presented the actual racial ideology of the Nazis as of secondary importance to the Nazis' use of racism to spread discontent and disunity. Though some noted the racism of the Nazis, they all emphasized that the danger lay in Nazi methods not in the system's ideological components. Said differently, creating divisions and prejudice among people signified Nazism, while prejudiced beliefs and actions did not necessarily do so. This meant that as a solution, educators emphasized a kind of performed unity, which often ignored real conflict and grievances. An issue over the nature of intercultural education in New York City elucidates this issue. Herbert Kamas, a leftist organizer of a teacher training program on intercultural education, brought in speakers who provided scientific evidence of the equality of all humans, taught the values of various cultures, and criticized organizations which promoted discrimination. However, he was opposed by rightist teachers who criticized his method and fixated strictly upon performed unity and the highlighting of positive aspects of various cultures, ignoring any grievances. In one example, Teachers sent by Mary Riley of the Conservative Catholic Teachers Association complained of presenters in Kamasa's in-service. The teacher found herself uh, surprised that one of the speakers, a Roma Gans, speaking on Catholics and the world pattern of peoples, stood against all of the following, which we as Catholics represent. One might expect that from the teacher's surprise, registered by her emphasis of the word against, might have arisen from some anti-Catholic statement by Gans. Instead, the teacher stood at Gans speaking in opposition to popular but virulently anti-Semitic Catholic outlets such as Father Coughlin's radio show and the Brooklyn Tablet. In other words, the censure of those such as Father Coughlin, not his open anti-Semitism, raised the teacher's ire because such criticism undermined the perception of unity, which she believed would create, create its reality. Mary Riley, who also worked for the New York City Board of Education, signifies how cries for unity, originally meaning opposition to prejudice, could transform into the enforcing of consensus and the silencing of victims of discrimination. In one wartime article, she decried that the unscrupulous policy of a part of the press in magnifying race episodes is producing hate mongers. For Riley and for her conservative allies in the board, the airing of racist, quote, malicious acts, not the acts themselves, represented the problem of racism. The image of cultural unity was more important than the reality. In another case, Riley demonstrated how rightists associated leftists with Nazism. 
While on the Advisory Committee on Human Relations, a Dr. Adele Sicular produced a plan for dealing with un-American incident involving two teachers. All evidence suggests that these teachers had espoused racist or anti-Semitic attitudes. Nevertheless, Riley, who is also on the committee, urged Sicular to form a, quote, complete definition of un-American, one which did not ignore leftist un-Americanism. Using Sicular's plan to attack left liberals and communists, Riley demanded that, quote, class against class is as fascistic as pitting religion against religion and race against race. Hitler in Germany and left wingers in New York City used the same technique, namely divide and conquer. For here, as in Europe, the Jew versus Catholic propaganda is creating a split in the population through which the anti-Americans will enter and take over. Riley's involvement in the plan allowed her to reorient a program designed to combat domestic prejudice. Using terminology associated with anti-Nazism, divide and conquer, Riley associated left-wingers with Hitler by fixating on the Nazis' perceived method of attack rather than on their ideological purposes. Though only a single example in one school district in the United States, the use of language which invoked an image of Nazism to tar left-leaning liberals and communists reverberated throughout the entire Cold War. With the coming of McCarthyism, right-wing extremists consistently accused outright and through associative language their liberal opponents of using Nazi methods. This signaled for Americans that these perceived enemies of democracy might accomplish the same murderous results as seen in the liberated camps. They attacked federal aid for education as a mess of Nazi spinach because it strengthened the federal government. They attacked UN efforts at world government comprised of the Hitlerian technique in which, quote, an idea is expressed repeated over and over again until it will finally come to be accepted as true. They found Brotherhood Week program which criticized generations racial policies similar to those, quote, employed by Hitler who urged children to inform on their parents. Ultimately, the late 1940s saw conservatives appropriate language anti-racists had used to combat the Nazis. They utilized these terms and ideas to associate liberals and communists with the recently viewed atrocities of Nazi Germany, and this helped domestic fascists both sidestep accusations of their own similarities to the Nazis and provided fear-laden examples of the consequences of an oft-invoked, ever-present, but never arrived, liberal-aided communist takeover. Thank you so much, Ryan. The final presentation in our panel will be from Megan Hunt. Dr. Megan Hunt is a teaching fellow in American history at the University of Edinburgh. She will be presenting her paper, Bringing the Millennium to Birmingham to Kill a Mockingbird and Racial Protests in Alabama's Magic City. On April 3rd, 1963, residents of Birmingham, Alabama woke to triumphant newspaper reports of a new day, penned by its mayor-elect, Albert Boutwell. A segregationist, Boutwell was unlikely to bring the millennium to Birmingham, according to Martin Luther King Jr. But he touted himself as a racial moderate and celebrated his victory immediately at an illustrious North Alabama premiere of To Kill a Mockingbird. Here, in front of 600 of the city's most prominent citizens, Boutwell welcomed Birmingham school children Mary Badham and Philip Alford, the young actors now immortalized as Scout and Jem Finch, to the stage at the segregated Melba Theatre. He promised them a better Birmingham. Across town, April 3rd marked the beginning of Project X, a consolidated effort to draw attention to the city's appalling conditions and entrenched racism as part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC, wider push for federal civil rights legislation. Deferred until after the mayoral election, it emerged as a turning point in the civil rights movement, the breakdown in social order forcing President John F. Kennedy to finally acknowledge civil rights as a moral issue and propose federal legislation in Congress. But in the Alabama House of Representatives, the language was much less calm. Jefferson County delegates cried anarchy and argued that their city had, quote, been invaded by foreigners who would by force and violence attempt to overthrow laws that may not be to their liking. This cannot be tolerated in any free democratic society. When viewed together, the election, premiere and Project X offer a composite image of the city's culture and self-image as it entered a defining era of racial tension. Various groups attempted to manage and propagate these competing visions of the city, as white Birmingham moderates willfully denied the civil rights protests that were happening just streets away. To its black residents, Birmingham in the early 1960s was a police state, 
long synonymous with oppressive racial violence. In April 1960, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Harrison Salisbury described how every medium of mutual interest, every reasoned approach, every inch of middle ground has been fragmented, not only by weapons, but by the mob, the police, and the many branches of the state's apparatus. Bull Connor was one of several city officials who filed libel suits against Salisbury, taking particular issue with his coverage of attacks on black churches and Jewish synagogues. Such writing apparently invited the false inference that city commissioners encouraged or condoned racial hatred or religious intolerance. The cases against Salisbury in the New York Times were eventually dismissed by the Supreme Court, but not until 1966. This was on First Amendment grounds but they portray an underlying obsession with image amongst Birmingham's powerful. Despite this, their commitment to racial segregation endured. In December 1961, the city's governing commission closed 67 city parks, eight swimming pools and four golf courses rather than integrate them under federal order. Then Mayor Art Haynes offered little ambiguity as to the symbolism behind his hardline decision. You for opening the parks, he told a resident, then friend you're for integration. Black and white children denied their usual recreational sites in the name of massive resistance came to communicate two extraordinarily different images of the city, images that came to a head in front of the world's press in spring 1963. At just 10 years old, Mary Badham was the youngest person ever nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress and was provided with a police and sirens escort to the downtown movie theater for her hometown premiere. Less than a month later, on May 2nd, that same police department arrested over 600 black high school students, generating what Alden Morris calls a human drama that could not be ignored by major media. With the jails full, hundreds of additional students who marched on May 3rd were met with billy clubs, fire hoses and dogs, viciously attacked as they attempted to reach City Hall. Morris highlights the effort that the SCLC took to avoid rather than provoke Bull Connor, but it remains evident that the mainstream media had initially shown little interest in the Birmingham campaign until this violence. After the first day of peaceful sit-ins, Fred Shuttlesworth lamented the lack of local coverage, arguing, we have ceased to be page seven copy, we're front page business. He then acknowledged an unwilling ally in Governor George Wallace, elected in November 1962 on a platform of bold resistance to segregation, to desegregation efforts. Singling out the Birmingham News and the Birmingham Post Herald in particular, Wallace publicly recalled what he called big black headlines about recent racial violence in Albany, Georgia and Greenwood, Mississippi, but criticised a complete news blackout about Birmingham. Providing only perfunctory lists of those arrested and sycophantic praise of local law enforcement's cool heads and sound judgment, the local press had adopted what Newsweek called an ostrich-like stance. On April 5th, 1963, an editorial called for, quote, responsible Negro leadership, as outside agitators are who are here stirring up trouble have nothing to lose. They make a profession of troublemaking and take from it profitable returns. Such protesters, the Post Herald continued, have no concern for our city, its people, or its problems. The paper called for patience, restraint, and intelligence from city officials and police, as seen in Albany. Such behaviours had won the respect and sympathy of people all over the country. So when rapidly spreading disorder prompted the Kennedy administration to push local power structures for a biracial settlement in Birmingham, and propose federal legislation, it was because of the courage and determination of black students and high schoolers rather than the efforts of local elites. These young people undermined any illusion of progress that white moderates had pointed to in Boutwell's election and the child-centric gradualism of To Kill a Mockingbird. After all, local cinemas had otherwise refused to play the so-called social justice film since its release the previous Christmas and had only capitulated after months of lobbying from the Junior Chamber of Commerce. The protests that began across town on the same day as the premiere would eventually receive so much national and international media attention that they became a central point of inquiry for European journalists reviewing To Kill a Mockingbird at the Cannes Film Festival in France. The film's star, Gregory Peck, faced what the Associated Press called a barrage of questions on Birmingham during a 45-minute press conference and was eventually given a standing ovation. Tangled in a web of national myth-making, the California-born actor revealed, I have never felt intolerance. 
I'm thankful that I was born in an area where this type of prejudice doesn't exist. Deflecting racial tensions to the South alone, Peck participated in the internal Orientalism noted by scholars such as David Janssen, Leanne Duck, and Joseph Crispino, propagating a, a long-standing US nationalist discourse that enabled segregation to not only endure, but reproduce. After all, despite the apparent symbolism of Atticus's courage and Boutwell's election in Birmingham, white attitudes were hardly softening in Alabama. In 1961, Martin Luther King warned the Freedom Riders that they would never make it through Alabama. Brutal attacks in Anniston and Birmingham proved the legitimacy of his concerns. Images of a burning bus and bleeding activists splashed across international papers, the head of Birmingham's Chamber of Commerce embarrassed by them on a trip to Tokyo. But while some white Alabamians responded with concern for the unwelcoming image of their cities and state, 96% of them voted for George Wallace. With, with Alabama a one-party state, Wallace's real battle came in the Democratic primary. Here he won in a runoff, but he did not win Birmingham or Jefferson County more generally, where one in five Alabamians lived. As governor, Wallace therefore saw Bull Connor as his crucial ally in the state's largest metropolitan area. On segregation, the Birmingham News noted, Wallace and Connor stoke the same fiery furnace. Despite technically having no official role in Birmingham's new political system, Connor held on to his power largely because of police department loyalty and Wallace's support. They would work together soon after the protests began to propose a bill that increased appeal bonds in the city from $300 to $2,500. Such measures reflected the powerful threat that the SCLC posed to organize white supremacy, despite the relative failure of, of their recent campaign in Albany, Georgia. Unless the agitators can be controlled, Birmingham may wish it had Bull Connor in City Hall and someday may return to even harsher policies, lest it succumb to the degradation of Washington and other great American cities, the Charleston News and Courier reported. This editorial reprinted in the Birmingham Post-Herald invited white residents to ponder their recent choice of mayor, which had placed the fate of their city in the hands of a moderate. It also explains Wallace's outspoken desire to see racial disturbances on the covers of the local press, which had placed him incongruously in unison with Fred Shuttlesworth. For politicians like Wallace and Connor, the threat of black activism and the subsequent concessions from white power structures was business as usual. Undermining Boutwell's control of the city highlighted the hypocrisy and ineffectiveness of moderates, forcing Birmingham residents to choose between the moderate and hardline response to black protests. In an article largely given over to moderate complaints that King's protests were poorly timed and misdirected, even Time magazine lamented that the fuss made Bull Connor seem indispensable to many Birmingham residents. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. We will now start with the discussion portion of the panel. And I wanna kick this off by posing the question to you all of unity and the extremist, which seems to be a subject that present in every presentation. How would you say that historically what we're seeing here is an emphasis of this often constructed dichotomy? Well, uh, I think for in many cases, uh, unity often operated as a way of excluding because if uh, the, the fascists, if those on the, the far right in these cases could express what they meant by unity as those who agree with this particular uh, position or those who disagree with that particular position, obviously they could exclude the whichever set of people um, that they wanted to. For example, in uh, my case, often, oftentimes um, Mary Riley and other educators would express that they had no problem, they had nothing against Jews, it was the Jewish communists who didn't do things the right way, who um, made the rest of the Jews look bad. That was who they were against, right? And so they could say, unify with us behind these systems and beliefs, do the things that we want you to do, don't cause trouble, so to speak, and you can be a part of this, this group, this unity. And so what it did was uh, it, it obviously excluded certain sections, but it also defaulted um, whole groups to 
not acceptable until they cross lines and agree with us. So you know, Jews were seen as communists until they came and agreed with um, moderates or the right or whatever position was being espoused. In the case of the National Unity Party in Canada, um, as the name implies, uh, unity was, was obviously a, a central concept for them. And in some circles, their, their proposal for a, quote, better Canada um, was viewed to be progressive in that it was not anti-Catholic or anti-Protestant. So in some ways, it was, it was viewed to be a, a progressive idea. Therefore, some people were, were more comfortable getting behind it um, than they might otherwise have been. But it is striking to me that although the ideology that they presented, especially through the modern lens, but even at the time, was so extreme in terms of the degree to which they sought to marginalize um, immigrant Canadians and First Nations and people of color, uh, their message was very simple. It, you, could, you could put it on the bumper sticker, people could understand it. It was very simple to communicate. It didn't leave a lot of room for hair splitting, uh, for how many angels dance on the head of a pin kind of discussions. I found no records of the uh, Manitoba fascists and the Nova Scotia fascists and the British Columbia fascists having detailed arguments about specific aspects of their platform. They just had kind of a simple unifying concept, which contrasts starkly with the debates that exists between the Communist Party of Canada and the quasi Trotskyist League for Revolutionary Workers Party, which would quibble about the tiniest detail and couldn't work together even for a very, very limited kind of activity that everyone agreed was important. I think for me, the I guess the main emphasis is is just this idea of, of who gets to speak for Birmingham was quite often um, the language that was used. Um, and, and that kind of then feeds into this sort of repression of, of um, you know, what, what the, pe the press is saying, whether that's the national press or the local press, there's a real sense that the image of the city is at stake here. Um, and, and those who criticize it, particularly if they are classed as outsiders, um, that they are kind of, you know, that they're the ones who are bringing this disrepute. There's never any real sense that actually maybe it's our, you know, horrendous record on, on you know, on civil rights or the levels of violence, white violence that we see in the city. There's, there's no real sort of soul searching um, in the press that that might actually be what's doing the damage. It's very much kind of deflected onto whoever's kind of making the noise at the time. Um, and I think what's interesting is the way that the press sometimes you know can be quite open about the segregationist values of people like George Wallace and Bull Connor and can you know um, not necessarily say they are wrong but it can definitely um, indicate that it recognizes that these things don't sit well on the national scene they don't they don't um, you know en entice businesses to Alabama all of that is very conscious in the kind of um, the elites in Birmingham but at the same time, they don't think that people like Martin Luther King are any better. Um, and so that's why there's this con constant emphasis on, on moderation and, and making sure that moderate voices, moderate local voices are, are heard. So there, there really does seem to be a kind of complete disparaging on, of, of both sides of, of what they would see as extremists. Um, and the idea that you know, if, if one is allowed to outshout the other, then it's, you know, it's hardly... Um, surprising that people then go and vote for people like Bull Connor or George Wallace because there is this perception that that it is a choice between the two extremists and the moderates sort of try to insert themselves into that and say you know that they offer solutions um, but what they actually do is they don't really say anything you know and, and then they wonder why then people kind of merge more towards what they see as extremes really so i think what you see is the, a real failure for the, those moderates to really assert what they do that's different because for obviously for for martin luther king and for his allies you know albert boutwell is just a dignified bull connor is is the exact language that they use you know this is someone who's still overtly a segregationist so by their standards is no different um, whereas, you know, they would also argue that people like King are, are extremists as well. So it's that real kind of middle ground and, and who they 
believe speaks for them that I think is really interesting, but then at the same time fail to realize that they offer very little. I, I wonder how much of the discussion of unity has to do with the obsess obsession with image, you know, that the, the portrayal of this image to whether it's, you know, on a national level, the outside world, or, uh, you know, in Birmingham, the, the, the rest of the country, um, how much is the, the discussion of unity um, to represent whatever group it is that's, that's claiming unity as a norm and also as moderate and as acceptable to, you know, to those outside? Did y'all see that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the, I think all of the groups in the story I was telling, um, I'd frame it as respectability. Everyone was chasing respectability. The National Unity Party was chasing respectability uh, in that it was sh very much shrouding itself with, with the exception of the Nazi trappings, obviously. They were still very much shrouding themselves in the vernacular, in the imagery of being good Britons, being good members of the British Empire and upholding all of those ideals. Uh, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation and the Canadian League for Peace and Democracy were very much shrouding themselves in this is, this is how respectable people resist this kind of movement. We're going to be over here. We're not going to come close to you. We are going to quietly protest in a very civilized way. We will not march. There will be no violence, etc. And then you have this small group that sets that respectability off to the side and says, no, now is the time for action. The time for words has passed. I think with, um, with Birmingham, it's that idea that, um, you know, that this change is happening in spite of the people in power, bizarrely. You know, you have a, a new moderate mayor who's just been elected, but you also have an existing political system in the city that just refuses to leave office. So actually a lot of the a lot of the kind of tension in, in Birmingham is obviously massively exacerbated by the fact that you literally have two political systems sort of coexisting. Um, and even at the, the premiere of To Kill a Mockingbird, you have Boutwell on the stage with members of the previous commission who are sort of, that's meant to be their sort of farewell. But then the next day they keep showing up for work and they refuse, they literally refuse to leave their offices. Um, so, so, you know, you have a very conscious battle of, you know, who's actually um, in charge here and therefore who gets to make decisions um, that just seems to really evaporate any opportunity for, for middle ground because people are just really sort of grappling for power. Um, and so I think it shows that those, those racial moderates who are technically have been elected, um, that this change, what, what, you know, regardless of what that is, whether it's, you know, a kind of real hardline segregation or whether it is desegregation, it will happen in spite of them. Um, you know, it will happen in spite of Albert Boutwell. It will happen in spite of, you know, people like Atticus Finch, the people that he represents. Um, so I think that's the, I guess, I'm not sure if that kind of speaks exactly to what you were saying, but I think it kind of um, rings true for me that these people are in, technically in power, but they will, they are being cast aside because they, they don't offer anything in this sort of moment, really. I, I think that one subject I saw mentioned several times now in your answers as well as in your papers and that I find particularly interesting is the sort of role of the local moderate as the ideal role of moderation that we should listen to because this this is dating back to pretty much every revolution and social upheaval after the French Revolution is chalked up to the outside agitator as a sort of I want to say boogeyman that comes in and um, does all the things we tend to see as negative, meaning violent protests and so on and so forth. So I think that portraying oneself as local and as moderate is, is, is a very powerful tool in terms of um, how legitimacy works in situations of social upheavals would you see that reflected within your subject as well as this sort of like focus on the peacefulness and the rejection of violence as a tool of legitimacy as well so in the case of the national unity party in toronto it sort of cut both ways in terms of who was the outside agitator and that 
has shifted from, say, newspaper coverage at the time to the, the subsequent scholarship on the matter. So at the time, the loudest, noisiest, anti-fascist resistors were centered around the League for a Revolutionary Workers' Party, which was a predominantly Jewish organization. The membership was overwhelmingly Jewish. Um, almost all of the members I've been able to identify were born in Canada. Their parents, however, were of the generation that fled Eastern Europe um, just before the 1905 pogroms. So they were often framed by, in the literature um, of the National Unity Party, of the supporting groups who wanted to frame the issue as fascism is, uh, is a deeply, is the solidification of our Britishness. The League for Revolutionary Workers Party, which was in fact almost completely homegrown, young men and women who had been born in Toronto, they were presented as the outside agitators. They were presented as elements of the Judeo-Bolshevik myth. Conversely, the scholarship that has developed since then, uh, that's why I sort of referred to the arrival in quotes of the National Unity Party, because there was an indigenous to Toronto fascist movement but it was fairly minor relative to the leadership that had arrived from Montreal, where the movement had greater support and deeper roots. So subsequent literature discussing this movement in Toronto has then framed the fascist leadership as coming to Toronto, as being outside agitators from Montreal. So we see that, that shift of who are the outside agitators but both sides very much trying to frame the other as being the foreign, the other, the different outside agitators. In Birmingham, the, the obvious outside agitator obviously is someone like Martin Luther King. Um, and obviously that's language that has, you know, he was, you know, fully expecting by that point in his career. It's, it's a term that had been used, obviously, many, many times before and would be used many times again. Um, and it's something that he kind of tackled head on, you know, in his sort of letter from Birmingham jail, he talks about why he's in Birmingham. And he explicitly says, you know, because I have organizational ties here, because I was asked to come here. Um, and, and so he's often criticized, even by some sort of black elite, sort of black moderates in, in the city for not giving this new, um, this new sort of moderate city government a chance. Um, and so they they really argue that, you know, it's, it's constantly this language of patience and restraint, um, whether that's coming from kind of white or black critics. And obviously he takes on that criticism um, in, in the letter. Um, and, and he, you know, says, you know, that how many times can we hear the word wait? And, and you know, that anyone who tries to put a time frame on another man's freedom and, and uses all of this language. Um, and yet, you know, at the time, it was very obvious when you look at Alabama in those days to, to point to the kind of hardline segregationists and people like George Wallace and people like that. But Albert Boutwell, um, you know, he'd been lieutenant governor. He'd referred to the 1957 Civil Rights Act as a piece of monstrous legislation in a, a radio address that he did for the White Citizens Council. He was also the co-author of the pupil placement plans, the freedom of choice plans that let white parents basically completely bypass the obligations of Brown versus Board of Education. And so this is someone who's touted as a moderate and yet has done more actively to prevent, you know, desegregation than, than some of the sort of hardliners who, yes, might, you know, obviously have articulated more um, I guess more extreme views but in terms of the power that someone like Boutwell had in Alabama you know these are the kinds of people who are actively preventing desegregation and so which is why you know obviously King can see that and he articulates that but it's interesting then that those people who are actually doing the most to to uphold the, the power structures of white supremacy are the ones who also articulate themselves as, as being in the middle um, and, 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 you know, they, they literally justify their own existence through that, um, through, through moderation, through kind of um, constantly using this language of outside agitators, whether that's, you know, on, on either side. And yet they are actually the ones who are, you know, confining the, the sort of options of, 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 you know, people in Birmingham much more. Well, what I really uh, noted was, as uh, Dr. Winsel pointed out in his, that moderates tended to 
uh, accept fascism as acceptable to some degree and certainly didn't oppose it, right? He talked about the radicals being the ones who, who opposed um, the fascists. In my case, in the, the educators, the, the New York City Board of Education uh, was conservative, moderate, and liberal, right? It was made up of a number of those central um, groups, but Mary Riley, who was on the conservative end, had no problem getting uh, liberals to agree with, to work with her um, position and ultimately her attacks on the, the intercultural education. So um, as uh, Andrew Pfeffer pointed out in, in bad faith, liberals were complicit in kind of the, the post-war, Cold War, uh, McCarthyist attack on uh, communists that, that, as I pointed out, did utilize this language um, of, uh, of, of anti-totalitarianism that borrowed a lot of uh, understandings of what the Nazis had done. And as, as far as uh, this term divide and conquer shows up, I think it's a term that, that notes absolutely the idea of outside agitators. And it was used um, by educators, particularly in the South, um, but, but even uh, later in New York City during the, the periods of desegregation. Right? A lot of times desegregationists in uh, Texas, uh, another area that I study, used um, the term divide and conquer to say that um, communists, uh, Jewish organizations, and the NAACP, which they also labeled as communists, were all working in the South to stir up racial prejudices through desegregation, and that that was an effort at, at divide and conquer, right? And in this, they often used um, that term divide and conquer, but a number of others to suggest that what these groups were doing, what the NAACP was doing, was akin to what the Nazis had done to create, um, you know, subversive activities, to, sub to create racial struggles. They constantly said, we didn't have any racial problems until the NAACP came in and stirred everything up. Um, and, and so you absolutely see uh, that rhetoric used, used that way. I think another thing that's interesting that you see certainly in Birmingham and, and um, well, in, in Alabama more generally is the way that hardline segregationists like George Wallace literally want to draw attention to racial disturbance as a way to kind of justify their own existence as well. So this sort of outside agitator language is on the one hand something that moderates use obviously to articulate their position and, and why they're necessary you know that to sort of justify themselves but you also see i think one of the most interesting things that i came across was the fact that you know fred shuttlesworth is literally citing george wallace as a reason why you know george george wallace as an unlikely ally against the press because both of them for very different reasons are saying why are we not front page news? And the fact that the governor of Alabama wants racial disturbances on the front of the local papers um, is something that initially seemed very, you know, was like quite strange to, to kind of get your head around. But obviously the moderates and the, the local press are deliberately trying to play this down. And so these, these press strategies alone demonstrate these kind of divisions within white Birmingham and, and I guess the state more generally. Whereas those who are obviously very firmly on the right actively want this kind of sort of showdown because it affirms why they're necessary. And what's interesting then is that to a certain extent, you might expect the local press to deliberately try and kind of keep this stuff um, under wraps so that, you know, obviously, as we know, it, it, it doesn't maybe, you know, reach national level. But but once it does, you know, they there's almost, yeah, this sense that Wallace, Wallace knows that he benefits from that kind of politics. And even a lot of people who would have previously considered themselves moderate start to argue that actually, you know, his kind of hardline stance or Bull Connor becomes increasingly attractive to them. And then you even have places like Time magazine saying, you know, it almost that basically, yeah, you can see why people like Bull Connor have appeal if this is the level of disturbance and saying nothing about white violence, nothing about, you know, the way that protesters are, are handled for quite some time, but basically arguing that, you know, um, 
that yeah you can you can see the appeal of this kind of politics if the alternative if you have a moderate in power is that people like king come and 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 sort of start to take over the city so the way that that shifts and and the way that yeah you you create you have these unlikely alliances between the governor and the civil rights protesters around the lack of media attention is is yeah is quite strange <laughs> but either, either way leads to no change <laughs> But certainly there's um, interesting ways that um, both, both groups also not just wanting the image of, of the, the protest, not just wanting the image of what's happening to be up there, you know, on, on both uh, of the more uh, radical sides, but um, in, in education in, in Texas, you certainly see the more radical segregationists um, sparking conflict and, and, you know, there's uh, in Mansfield in uh, 56, there's um, a 500 person riot outside of a school that is attempting to integrate that keeps the black students out. And in that case, Eisenhower doesn't send any troops. And a lot of times what the what the segregationists say in letters to editors and whatnot is this is what happens. You've destroyed a, you know, perfectly good community by trying to come in and integrate, right? So they spark violence themselves and then accuse, you know, anyone coming in from the outside. This is what happens when you try to, you know, do anything in this community essentially that might create change. And uh, a Senator from Georgia, you know, writing in the 57 in Central High School at Little Rock accuses Eisenhower of, you know, being Hitlerian and sending in, uh, you know, jackbooted stormtroopers and accusing him of totalitarian, you know, Hitlerian tactics, um, again, in an issue sparked by local uh, radical desegregationists, and then, of course, the, the governor. I mean, in this sense, it would probably be possible to say, like, everyone I don't like is a communist, really, because, like, I also got the, the, the very strong sense that, you know, even when people are opposing something like the National Unity Party, which is seen as as definitely something of an outside force, being that they are strongly associated with, with Nazi Germany, even then it's, it's a problem that the people who are opposing racism, who are opposing fascism, are painted generally as communists as a way to delegitimize them and to make them out as, as something even more foreign or dangerous than, than the fascists are. And I think that it's really fascinating that this is something that seems to work even up until today as a, as a sort of tactic to discredit people and to discredit a movement for change, really. One thing I would notice that I think during the period that I study, um, uh, obviously in the 30s, uh, in twenties, there had been anti-communism in, in this "everyone I don't like is is communist" uh, thing that you pointed out. But uh, through the course of the early nineteen forties, I'm sorry, the late nineteen forties, a lot of what happens is ideas of anti-Nazism do get tied up even with communism, and so you have a conflation of a lot of the issues under this category of totalitarianism. And so, uh, by stating that you know, communists and Nazis are both totalitarian, then a lot of the ways that the Nazis used and gained power then became associated with communists. You see a lot of conflation of uh, concentration camps and gulags, and therefore death camps and gulags. And so, um, though a lot of times you do see the uh, accusations of communism, when you look at some of the language of what they're attributing to communists, they're attributing uh, images of, of Nazism to communists or to groups that they're wanting to accuse of communism. So I think that's a really fascinating aspect of, of these accusations of communism um, or that often they're, they're tinged and around the edges, there's uh, this, this combination of, of communism with Nazism in the minds of, of many. A another layer to those complications in, in my era in the 1930s was uh, anti-Stalinist Marxism, where lowercase c communists or Marxists were anti, could also be anti-Stalinist and anti-Soviet Union, um, and therefore on the outside of the Communist Party, and therefore an enemy of that family of communists, which led to all these additional complications, which at the 
when you look at the newspaper coverage, just creates this mess of who is for or against what, because the anti-fascists are often painted as pro-communists, um, which, which is an unfair narrowing of the concept. But as you point out, Joe, that's, that's, how you, that's how you discredit people at that time by conflating anti-fascism with pro-communism and you marginalize those ideas. And then even amongst those people who actually are pro-communist, what kind of communist are they? And then the infighting that occurs uh, through that group is very problematic for them working together, but affords this tremendous opportunity for, for organizations like the National Unity Party or even less extreme right-wing groups to paint any kind of anti-fascist resistance as just being either pure communism or veiled communism. Um, so there's no, I haven't come across any explicit, like in the press, um, use of, of the words communism when describing these sort of protests. But I think, you know, essentially they can be, they're, you know, they're, they're interchangeable with things like outside agitator and, and, and many of the other, those other kind of terms that are regularly used. Um, and so I think even the, you know, the, the delegates from Birmingham and from the surrounding Jefferson County, they, uh, in the Alabama House of Representatives, say that their city has been invaded by foreigners. That, that's their exact phrase. Um, and they also say this cannot be tolerated in any free democratic society. So, you know, I think we can definitely make the, the leap for them there about what they're actually kind of implying about, about these protesters. Um, and the way that that language is kind of interchangeable. They also explicitly use the word anarchy and, and anarchists. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Certainly the term uh, Americanism shows up in New York City and in Texas among educators. Does it also uh, in, in Birmingham at that time, or is that not a concept that was utilized? Um, yeah, they, I'm not explicitly, but they do talk about the degradation of American cities um, and the idea that, that if Birmingham kind of gives in to these protests, that it will lose, um, it, will, it basically will be degraded in the way that, and I think they name like New York, Washington, D.C. in particular. So I think, um, you know, I, I think they, they're making very conscious references to big sort of industrialized cities with big black populations, basically, um, and arguing that if this kind of, um, you know, protest is tolerated, that basically places like Birmingham will lose their their sort of American, yeah, their, their yeah, I guess, Americanism or their kind of distinctive, I, I guess that to a certain extent, they're probably thinking specifically about being Southern cities as well and the idea that they would lose that sort of distinction. But they do talk about the degradation of American cities by protesters and anarchists and, yeah, which um, is, is that definitely linked. I think it's fascinating that we, we have talked a lot now about these sort of like ex-territorialization of those we do not see as explicit in, in the context of the protests or of those who are not seen as explicit by the majority of the people. But seeing how we're talking about North America and, and, and Canada and the US, one thing I was wondering is regularly these days, free speech is brought up as a sort of blanket justification for a lot of things in contemporary political discourse. And I was wondering, like, how is this subject, if at all, reflected within your areas of uh, expertise? Is it used at all? Is, it, is, is there sort of a, like, British or Anglo-American exceptionalism invoked surrounding free speech? In the Canadian context, the free speech debate came up a great deal. Uh, there was a number of debates about whether or not the Toronto City Council should intervene and make sure that the National Unity Party could not get a venue uh, in order to have their speech at all. So the mayor at the time was actually on the board of directors for Massey Hall, and he was asked specifically to intervene to see if they could maybe shut down the event to make sure that they couldn't get, uh, couldn't get the hall for that evening. And he declined to do so. Uh, they did not allow the National Union Party to take, have their rallies in, uh, in a public venue or to have a public march. Uh, 
And there was a great deal of support in the newspapers, like a lot of letters to the editor saying that this, this is a matter of free speech. We should not be deplatforming this kind of organization. However, most of the public outcry was only really focused on ensuring the National Unity Party had their opportunity to speak. It wasn't so much about making sure that the protesters had the opportunity to conduct peaceful protest. The peaceful protests, which sometimes did turn violent, but was not violent on this particular night, uh, was they, they were framed as being the, the dangerous anarchists, the threats to law and order. The, their concerns were not framed through the free speech lens. It was very much a one-sided, we need to ensure that the National Unity Party is given the opportunity to speak, at least uh, in the media coverage at the time. In, in New York City, certainly in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, early 1940s, free speech is part of Americanism. It's scientific. Uh, educators should allow the free speech to such a degree that in some teachers' journals, there were people advocating for allowing uh, fascists and racist opportunities to speak at, uh, you know, student programs in, fr in front of students. Um, and then, of course, having someone else speaking, quote, you know, on behalf of Americanism and, and democracy or whatnot. So free speech was certainly advocated, but um, the fixation in the later 1940s, of, uh, and sorry, as part of that propaganda uh, what educators taught was propaganda analysis. How do you know what someone's trying to say and trying to, to you know, have you believe and whatnot? And so there was a focus on propaganda analysis. In the late 1940s, uh, the people that had promoted propaganda analysis were called communists and silenced. Um, and then uh, the move became that propaganda should uh, be kept out of schools and so you saw an assault on the UN and on UNESCO who tried to, you know, according to some, uh, destroy home education by teaching these subversive materials in class. And so um, there was much less of a discussion of free speech other than to say that by getting rid of propaganda in the schools, this will allow Americans to keep their freedom of speech. I guess the interesting thing about free speech as I guess kind of advocated or rallied around in 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 Alabama in this point in in history in the 60s is that so I mentioned in my paper that in the various commissioners in Birmingham filed for libel against Harrison Salisbury who was a Pulitzer winning uh, journalist who'd written this big piece about Birmingham in 1960 um, and they obviously filed libel against him. But there was also a similar case brought uh, by people in Montgomery because they argued that they were also kind of denigrated by this journalism. So there's a real sense in the state uh, that, you know, that the kind of national media is trying to present uh, Alabama in a certain way and that and, and they wanted to kind of uh, push back against that. And, and obviously they were eventually, they, these claims were eventually pushed out by um, by the Supreme Court on First Amendment grounds. But I think similar to, to what everyone else has said, really, it's this, this kind of free spe speech debate only quite often seems to veer in one direction. It only seems to apply to, to sort of one group. And certainly in terms of who's arguing they're being silenced um, is, is, is often quite one-sided. Um, so certainly the, the Alabama courts were very sort of supportive of this idea that, that the kind of national press was presenting the state in this kind of egregious manner. Um, and so, you know, they were found guilty in Jefferson County courts. Um, Sal Salisbury himself faced 21 years in jail um, and, and also fines, you know, so, so there was, there's a real distinction between the local courts, obviously, and then eventually these cases reach the Supreme Court and it takes six years. Um, so it is a really kind of interesting case in terms of how the media is kind of being represented in, within the state and this idea that kind of national media um, is, is so very different from the kind of local state media and what that means for free speech in, in, in the state itself. Um, is really interesting. But I think then you also have to think about the way that national media and, and US nationalism obviously was very much invested in the, the sort of Southern exceptionalism idea as well, that actually, you know, that, that these, not to say that these um, 
reports into the South were necessarily false or in any way, um, or to show any sympathy with people like Bull Connor. But it is important, I think, that, you know, if you think about the way um, in my paper, I talked about even people like Gregory Peck saying, well, you know, I was born in California, we don't have prejudice there. You know, there is this kind of commitment um, of US nationalism to this idea that that race is a Southern problem that, that I think we need to kind of think about as well, when we're thinking about how you know, how the media kind of presents these issues. So thank you for this very interesting discussion and uh, this very enlightening, those very enlightening contributions. I would now like to uh, hand over to you for closing remarks and final conclusions from you, the panelists. And um, thank you, Joe. So even though our, our three papers are are very different in many ways, and it stretch, stretches across three decades. Uh, I was struck by a number of things that seem to run true throughout. And Joe already touched on some of this, but I'll just amplify my main takeaways from this conversation. Uh, one of which is that fascist and racist groups, their ideology and belief very much lends itself to uh, to a degree of unity, to a degree of solidarity that allows them to act as a cohesive body. Conversely, the groups that oppose them, that are pushing for some kind of social change, um, do not necessarily lend themselves to solidarity uh, amongst their different interests, amongst their different core ideals. But it seems that that's a key and key concept for understanding which groups are successful and which groups are less successful in resisting fascist and racist organizations. And lastly, the, the idea of respectability, that idea that the, the moderate um, attempting to maintain their, their respectability, their standing in society, um, running headlong into other groups that are clamoring for that change and see the time for that polite conversation as having come to an end. Those are, those are kind of the three things that I see as running throughout all of our papers and kind of major takeaways for uh, perhaps what we are going through today. One thing that I see as running through all of these is that the uh, right wing, uh, racist, segregationist, uh, fascist groups uh, often want to sideline the uh, the idea of their own uh, racism. They don't want people to look at that so much uh, as they want to look at uh, the political methods of their opponents. So both they want to fixate on uh, protest of their opponents and make accusations of, of divisive uh, nature of those protests, that it destroys unity or nation or uh, whatever the group happens to be. Um, so that's one way that they do it. And the other is uh, they, they fixate on uh, the political rather than the ideological. So they look at the, the methods of the federal government, the methods of an opposing group, and that's where they make accusations uh, against their opponents. So they would make accusations that what the opponent says is propaganda, uh, it's an extreme use of federal power, it's a divide and conquer method meant to, to uh, subvert um, or that it's, you know, anti-parent anti education in some of the cases uh, that, that I see. And so um, oftentimes fascists to ignore, to push to the side their own problematic, uh, offensive racial ideology is uh, to make accusations that the real uh, Nazis and totalitarians are those who use X political methods or, or whatnot uh, to to act. And it's those political methods that makes Nazis Nazis or makes communists communists. I guess a lot of our discussion is obviously focused on moderate the idea of sort of political and they found a cinematic icon in Atticus Finch and they paraded their new day before the nation's media. Um, and so I think that just to kind of come back to the premiere a little bit more because I think it, it kind of fits with with some of these points Presumably the people in the cinema that night in Birmingham spent very little time dissecting the fact that in the courtroom in the film, African Americans are restricted to the balcony, um, obviously the film being set in the 1930s, and yet African Americans were restricted to the balcony that very night as the Melba was a, a segregated cinema. 
So it's hard to imagine that any black cinema goers, if indeed there were any on that night, were stood in awe of Atticus Finch, the way that those confined to the balcony in the film do, as he passes out after Tom Robinson's trial. Um, and many black residents had already uh, resented and resisted what was known as the dark and filthy steps that led to the coloured balcony of the Melba Theatre where their feet always stuck to the floor. Um, and President George W. Bush actually used a story of um, a child who remembered the segregated cinemas in Birmingham when he reflected on the significance of the Civil Rights Act in 2004, at the, the 40th anniversary. And so Dale Long, uh, who says he was just a child in 1964, already understood his parents' limited enthusiasm for cinema trips. Um, and so he reflected on the indignities of segregation, the significance of federal legislation first proposed due to protests in Birmingham itself. So I think that probably shows more than anything how the, the protests that were happening just streets away were so removed from what was obviously happening in the cinema that night and these different forms of, of, of kind of political moderation that, that we've sort of talked about and how then in George W. Bush's telling of this story, you know, it's the federal government that then intervened and, and kind of made sure that these indignities were put to rest. So there's a lot of work being done there around kind of racial moderation and, and whose kind of narrative of that story is told. Thank you so much for these uh, closing thoughts, for these final thoughts. And as someone who has both studied uh, fascism and Nazism and its racism, as well as revolutionary upheaval in the context of Germany, it's it's been such a joy to moderate this panel and to hear from all of you for you could have said someone here talking about the revolution in Germany in 1918-19 and it wouldn't have seemed displaced for the, 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 the interesting subjects and things we discussed today on moderates, on communists, on those wanting to change and those seeking to delegitimize it and to legitimize themselves. So from me personally, as well as from the Ask Historian subreddit, a heartfelt thank you to all our panelists for participating in this conference and experimenting with us on the format of the digital conference. And also from me personally, as well as Ask Historians, and I assume from our panelists as well, thank you uh, our attendees, our viewers, our watchers for looking at this panel, for watching it, for giving us these 90 minutes and, and listening to us give our presentations and talk about our thoughts. Um, I hope you will find the time to also ask us questions uh, in the subreddit. And once again, thank you. And until the next time.